Welcome everyone. We're here to talk about cybersecurity awareness tips to protect you and your data. My name is Dallas Hazelhorst. I'm the founder and owner of Treetop Security, where we specialize in cybersecurity solutions for small businesses. A little bit about me. I have been doing this for a while. I have multiple computer related degrees as well as a master's degree in information security engineering. Also, I have a alphabet soup of security related certifications and a number of other accomplishments in the IT and cybersecurity field. Enough about me though. Uh, a little bit about this presentation. Well, first and foremost, the slides here are available at treetopsecurity.com slash cat and that's uh, cybersecurity awareness training is what that's uh, abbreviated for. Um, the, that is important because inevitably I forget to mention that. And so I will see somebody hurriedly writing every single thing that's on every single slide down until I remember to tell them that, hey, you can download these. Um, still, please take notes. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no reason to write down everything. Also, in regards to the notes, in the lower right-hand corner, you'll actually see that there is a slide number down there. And so if you do happen to write any notes, you can absolutely reference the slide deck itself and the two should uh, correlate with one another. Now, about this particular slide deck, um, we actually released this as open source late last year. And which means that anybody can download it, anybody can make changes to it. Um, and that's really, really cool. It has been downloaded now in over 150 countries in less than a year. So people are taking it back to their communities, back to their organizations. Uh, heck, maybe even downloading it and using it to create some of their own materials. That's fantastic. The end goal is to increase cybersecurity awareness um, amongst users all over the globe. Also, um, this has been shared and recommended at numerous security conferences, including the RSA conference in February 2020. So that's really, really cool. All right, so live, laugh, get hacked, and stop laughing. Now, this is meant to bring a little bit of, of light to the subject, but in reality, you know, hacking and attacks have real world consequences. Businesses have went out of business as a result of a cyber attack. That's people's jobs, that's people's livelihoods. So definitely uh, not a laughing matter in those uh, instances. And you know, just keep in mind that these can have real world consequences. Here's a few of the things that we are going to cover today. In addition, we'll uh, cover some examples of phishing so you can actually spot them yourself in the future. Now, why is cybersecurity awareness important? Well, it's because technology alone cannot protect you from everything. Attackers will absolutely go where security is the weakest. And if you're not doing any sort of training, if you're not doing any sort of uh, awareness training, then your users are gonna be the weakest link. And so, you know, I always tell the story about uh, somebody came up to me after uh, one of our in-person presentations and said, hey, I thought that joke about the Girl Scouts getting their cybersecurity badges and you helping them was pretty funny. And I said, yeah, you know, the thing is, is that's not a joke. Uh, uh, as of a few years ago, this, the Girl Scouts actually did get a cybersecurity badge and I've helped their troops and things like that actually earn those, uh, including my daughters. Um, but, uh, you know, it really underscores the fact that, you know, who is cybersecurity awareness for? It's not just for business owners. It's not just for employees. It's for absolutely everyone. Now, the other thing that people always say is, well, my IT staff handles that. I don't need to take care of that. The thing is, is that a lot of these tips actually work as well for work as they do for home. So just keep that in mind, and especially in this environment where we're doing a lot of work from home, uh, these become even more important to the overall security of our businesses. So a common misconception is that people say, well, an attacker is not interested in me, and that unfortunately is exactly what the attacker wants you to believe. Uh, credit card data, financial data, we are all doing online banking, online credit cards. Um, those are absolutely fair game to attackers. Also, medical data, 
Um, medical data is actually far, far more valuable on the dark web than just credit card data. And the reason being is that our credit card companies have become very, very good at spotting fraud and they issue a new credit card number, uh, you know, pretty, pretty easily. Um, unfortunately, your medical data is not really, you know, doesn't, you're not able to just swap out your uh, social security number just willy nilly like that. Also, um, even if you don't have anything actually on your computer, computer resources themselves. So an attacker will actually get something on your system and actually utilize your computer to be able to do other things, whether it's crypto mining, also using your system to hack other places. So just keep that in mind that it's not just about the data that's on there. It can also be the computer, the resources themselves. Now, the other thing that uh, I always remind people of is that, uh, you know, somebody says, well, I don't keep any data on my computer. It's not a big deal. Well, okay, but do you access your email? Well, yeah, I access email, but my email doesn't have any credit card data or medical data or anything like that. But then you start talking through the whole scenario that, okay, if you go to your bank and you forget what your password is, where does that recovery, that reset come back to? comes back to your email. If you go onto Facebook and you say, oh, I forgot my password, where does that reset come back to? It comes back to your email. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, email is not that important. And then you start talking through it and they start figuring out all the other accounts that are actually tied to your email. And all of a sudden it becomes vitally important to them. All right, so enough with the doom and gloom. Let's uh, go ahead and figure out some ways that we can actually protect ourselves. Well, First and foremost, backups. And you may say, well, backups, those are pretty mundane. That doesn't sound really cybersecurity anything. Uh, and the truth is, is that uh, backups are absolutely vital to cybersecurity. And the reason being is that in a lot of ways, they're the only guaranteed protection against ransomware. Um, now that does come with a few caveats. Number one is that, you know, you can't have your backup media, say like if you're backing up to say a USB drive, you can't have that drive plugged in at all the times because if your computer gets ransomware, the first thing that does is going to ransomware your USB drive or anything else that's connected to it. The other thing uh, to remember is that backups are only as good, <laughs> only good if you're actually testing them. Uh, so, you know, from years and years and years of working in IT space, I can tell you there were a ton of times where businesses thought they had, you know, six months work of back, worth of backups, and we ended up having to go back even further, maybe a year or so, um, to actually get a good, valid backup. So if you do have backups, make sure that you are testing them as well. So updates. Another one of those things that doesn't sound very cybersecurity-ish, um, but is absolutely important to cybersecurity. And there, the idea behind updates is that what was secure yesterday may not necessarily be secure today. Um, so that's why we have updates. Uh, there are new vulnerabilities found every single day. Um, as many as 360,000 new pieces of malware are released every single day. And that number still is boggling to my mind, even though I've been doing this for a very, very long time. Now, when we're talking about updates, what are we actually talking about? Well, first and foremost, your operating system. So Microsoft Windows, Apple Mac OS, Linux. Um, keep in mind that Windows 7, uh, the Windows uh, operating system that was very, very popular, um, just came into life in January of 2020, unless you have some special arrangements or you're paying for updates from Microsoft. So just keep that in mind. What that is, uh, why that's important is because if say a new vulnerability comes out tomorrow or next week or next month, a huge vulnerability comes out, Microsoft's not gonna update that. So your system is just gonna be sitting there as a sitting duck. Also, traditional antivirus. Um, you know, the way that traditional antivirus works is that, yeah, you have the program on your computer, but it constantly has to receive definition updates to make sure that it knows what to block. Um, so if you're not getting those definition updates, you just as well not have antivirus. Now, if we're talking about traditional antivirus, uh, Symantec, Norton, McAfee, Windows Defender, Avast, and there's a zillion others that I could name off, um, but won't take the time. But just keep in mind that all of those require those latest definition updates to make sure that they're working properly. 
Also, don't forget, you know, seems like we can't do anything uh, with our computers these days without a browser. And so when we're talking about browsers, we're talking about Chrome, Firefox, Opera, Edge, Safari, any one of those. Um, you know, those do have to stay up to date. Now, most of those programs do a pretty good job of updating themselves, but it's not also not a bad idea to uh, go back in and also check those from time to time. Now, I do want to make a note there about Internet Explorer. You know, it's one thing for me to say, I don't recommend Internet Explorer anymore. Um, it's a whole nother thing when the makers of Internet Explorer, who are Microsoft, say don't use Internet Explorer anymore. So just quit using it. And inevitably somebody says, well, wait, I have a job that requires that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, use Internet Explorer for those websites that absolutely require it and then try and use something else, you know, Chrome or Firefox or whatever to browse the Internet for pretty much everything else. Now, also when we're talking about updates, you know, mobile devices. So your cell phone, all of us like to hit snooze, snooze, snooze on our mobile devices when it says that there are updates. Uh, keep in mind that those updates, as much as uh, it is about, you know, moving icons or changing the color of icons or, or just those types of things, there's also a whole slew of security updates that also come through with those. So just keep that in mind, uh, you know, the next time you're snoozing those, make sure, you know, you don't have to accept them right away, especially if you're in the middle of something, but, you know, go ahead and, and do them uh, within a few days usually of, of getting those. Uh, last but not least, we have the Internet of Things. And here we're talking about, you know, Amazon Alexa, Google Home, uh, thermostats, doorbells, all sorts of things. Now, a lot of those manufacturers are doing a very, very good job of automatically updating their devices. Unfortunately, there's a lot of other devices that don't update automatically. They do have updates, but you have to manually do them. And so if we're talking about, you know, surveillance systems or TVs or light bulbs or smart locks or, you know, just keep going on and on and on, um, a lot of those devices, if they get a vulnerability today, that vulnerability is going to remain present on your network up until the time that you actually update it. And in a lot of cases, that never happens. So all about passwords. We'll let everybody go ahead and uh, read the, uh, the picture here. Now, obviously, the joke in this particular case is that it's easier to change the name of the dog than it is to change a password for most people. So, haha, -ha, pretty funny, right? Now, the cool thing about passwords, um, there are a few things about passwords, I should say. Um, first and foremost, you know, keep your passwords in a secure location. That does not mean a sticky note on your monitor or under your keyboard or in your desk drawer. Uh, do not use paper and sticky notes. Um, also, you know, don't store passwords in clear text on your computer. And by that, I mean in a Word document, in an Excel document, in a notepad document. Uh, that's very, very common. Now, um, a lot of people don't realize, you know, I also do uh, penetration testing. I don't do it very often anymore, but uh, part of that penetration test is after you get access to a system, you look around to see what else you can get. Well, if there are, there's a, a, a document on the desktop that said passwords.doc, guess what? Somebody's going to check that out. And that's not, you know, a pen tester being mean. That's exactly what attackers do as well. They try to get access to that and then they want to get access to several other things. Now, the cool thing is, is that there are password managers that take care of this for us. Uh, so if we're talking about, you know, LastPass or KeyPass or 1Password, those are all free utilities that we can use in order to handle this. Now, some of the benefits of a password manager, number one, you have a single really, really long password uh, for a... Uh, for your account, and then it actually stores all of those passwords in an encrypted format. So, you know, while it may look like your browser, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, my browser does this for me. No, it actually doesn't. Um, it looks the same, but it's very, very different in what it does. So just keep that in mind. Um, Autofilling your username and password. So instead of copying and pasting from that document on your desktop, um, you can absolutely go to these websites and it'll autofill that information in there for you. 
Um, also keep in mind that you can use these applications on different devices. So if you wanted to install it on your desktop, install it on your laptop, install it on your mobile, it'll actually sync those usernames and passwords across different sites. So very, very cool. A few tips about passwords. Um, number one, you know, make sure you're not using that, that little dog's name. Uh, we don't want to have to rename him. Um, but also, you know, don't use anything that can be associated with you. And we're talking about, you know, addresses, phone numbers, child names, uh, birthdays, uh, sports teams. And, and my neck of the woods, Chiefs 2020, uh, is probably a, a really popular password right now. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, so just make sure that you're not using things that are con really easy to guess or that are associated with you. Um, if you are using a password manager, we do have some additional uh, capabilities, which is using a separate password for every single account. That is absolutely important to do. And the reason being is that all these breaches we see in the news where, you know, somebody uh, gets access to usernames and passwords, well, what they do is they use that same or they, they know that users use that same username and password for multiple different websites. And so they then try it on Facebook and then they try it on the banking site and then they try it on all these other places. And so just make sure that you're using a separate password for every single one of those. Also um, with a password manager, we can use auto-generated unmemorable passwords. Um, that's just something you'll have to get over, uh, you know, that you're not gonna be able to remember every single one of those. And it's okay that it's a 20 character unmemorable password. Um, you know, you're just gonna, like I said, have to get over that. Now, passwords versus passphrases. Um, passphrases are absolutely helpful when it's something that we have to remember. Um, you know, if you're trying to get into your computer for the day, um, you can't really use a password manager to be able to <laughs> remember how to get into that computer. So instead, you can use a passphrase. Uh, what is a, exactly is a passphrase? Well, it's a really long phrase that bunches words and things like that together. And this is helpful because if we're looking at passwords, Length is far better than complexity. So if we look at those two examples that are there, you know, uppercase P at sign SSW0RD is a absolutely horrible password, but it fits every password complexity on the planet. It has an uppercase, it has a lowercase, it has numbers, it has uh, special characters, it's eight characters. Um, but yeah, just don't use that password. Now, if I would have told you before we started here that you're going to be able to remember really easily a 24 character password, you would have told me I was nuts. And that's because most people are used to these passwords that are, you know, hashtag, ups, up, or, uh, uppercase Y, lowercase L, you know, just this gobbledygook of things. But instead, if you're using a passphrase, for example, my son was born November 1995 exclamation point. That is a 24 character password and that is really, really easy to remember. Now, if we're looking at some of the statistics down below there, you'll see that, you know, 61% of people actually use a password that is exactly eight characters. And the reason why everybody does this is because that's exactly what the minimum is for pretty much every website, every system on the planet. Now, here's a fun little chart that uh, just shows the top 25 passwords by rank and year for the past three years. Um, not saying you necessarily need to uh, change these, you know, pause this video and go change them right the very second. Um, but absolutely, if you uh, are using any of these, uh, you should do so. Um, now, keep in mind that, uh, you know, these, a lot of these, they kind of change in their order, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine went from, you know, number six in 2017 to number three in 2018 to number two in 2019. But by and large, these kind of stay the same. Um, like I said, they change in their order, but, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six is, is uh, going strong, apparently. All right, so two-factor authentication. Now, a lot of people's eyes kind of glaze over when you start talking about two-factor authentication, and really the easiest way to think about it is that it's something beyond your username and password. It's a second form to prove who you are. If you've ever logged into your banking account or, you know, credit card or anything like that, and it says, we sent you, you know, you type in your username and password, 
and it says, we sent you a code, a six digit code, please uh, let us know what that is. And so you pick up your phone and you look at a text message and you got a six digit number in your text from your bank, congratulations, you've used two factor authentication. It says, you know, your one time code is, um, you know, two factor authentication can come in a number of forms, whether it is text messaging, uh, phone call, phone pop up, uh, Google and Apple both kind of use that. Um, you also have email can be used as a, a one time passcode. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways. Also, um, you know, some of the newer ways that we've started uh, seeing a lot of is uh, Google Authenticator, Authy. These are time-based one-time passwords. What that means is you have an application of some sort on your phone and your uh, websites and you ha basically have a link between them. And so every 30 seconds, every 60 seconds, that password, that code changes. And so if we're looking at that example over on the right there, Facebook has 334277. And so when you go to type in your username and password, it says, okay, you're on a new computer. What is your authenticator code? And so you'd have to type in that code. And if you don't get it quite in the right amount of time, <laughs> it switches that code on you and you have to have to be a little quick on the draw. But uh, yeah, it's just another way of protecting you. So, you know, like I said, don't uh, overthink it with what two-factor authentication really is. All right, so moving on, just a little click. So essentially, uh, you know, there's there's four steps when you're going through, um, you know, making sure that a, a link is valid. Well, number one, you know, the important thing to remember is that we're not just talking about email. Yes, you know, we talk about email a lot, but we could also be in social media where, you know, your friend gets hacked or whatever and it goes, sends a, uh, hey, check out this video to every single person in your Facebook uh, contacts. Um, you know, so keep that in mind that social media is another way for these links to come through. Also, SMS and iMessage are fantastic ways for attackers to uh, use links to try and uh, coerce you into clicking on something you really shouldn't have. Um, so we're gonna go through, we're gonna do that verify, we're gonna show hovering, which we'll uh, cover quite a bit. And then number three, we'll give it a sniff test. You know, uh, that's the dad and me coming out. Um, you know, give it a sniff test and make sure, is this something that you should be doing? You know, just kind of take a step back and think about things. And then last but not least, if all of those things are okay, then you can go ahead and click on it. All right, so let's go through a few examples here. Now this first one, hopefully, it's a really easy to recognize uh, scam. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, uh, Viagra has been around forever, used forever in spam and scams. Um, but uh, yeah, we're gonna go through kind of some red flags and you're gonna see this more of a, like a systematic thought process as we go through these that you can use the same thought process as we go through each one of them. Now, Viagra, obviously, um, strange wording. Everything is allowed, just don't forget Viagra. I mean, does anyone really talk like that? That's really, really odd. Uh, the email address, that email address, the under, online underscore pill shop, that's a really, really weird email address. Uh, domain name is pharmacy.canada. That is not somebody that I work with uh, quite frequently. Um, the expected email, is this something that you were looking for? Is this something you expected? If not, you know, that, that should probably uh, raise a red flag there. And then last but not least, we have the interesting link, which is the ship underscore now RX dash company. Um, so hopefully any one of those would kind of tip you off that this is not a legitimate email, but obviously adding them all together, um, this should, uh, you know, send all sorts of alarms off in your head that this is 100% not a legitimate email. Now, here's gonna be one that's probably a little bit more difficult to recognize. Now, this is a hacked email uh, from someone that you know. And so this is, uh, you know, if somebody's computer gets compromised or something like that, it go, turns around and can send an email to everybody that's in their contact list. And they're trying to get it because you're thinking, oh, well, I know this person, why wouldn't I click on, on this email from them? So if we're going through some of those same red flags, that same systematic process, we're looking at the email address is actually okay. Uh, the name of the person is okay. Now, this is a kind of an odd signature for that person. That's something that is easy for you and I to recognize. 
may not necessarily be easy for a computer to recognize. So that's going to be uh, very, very important as we go forward is that it requires some thought process, some cycles on your end. Um, also, is this an expected email? If all of a sudden, you know, you haven't talked to this person in six years and you just get an email out of the blue from that's a little fishy, right? And it's even probably more fishy if you're just getting an email that says, hey, here's a link and nothing else. That should be really, really odd to you. If we are looking at that link, um, you'll see that it's teamtext.fr. .fr is a country code for France. And so uh, needless to say, I don't have a lot of uh, business relationships in France. So um, all of those things, or at least a few of those things there, should definitely uh, tip you off that this is not a good email. Here, just kind of switching gears a little bit, this is actually a text messaging or SMS messaging example. And we've actually seen quite a few of these uh, just recently here, uh, especially this particular one, which is actually related to a FedEx package. Um, so, you know, if the name in the SMS message, if I'm receiving this text message and it says, hello, Isabella, um, my name's not Isabella, my name's Dallas. <laughs> that should be a, a, a giant red flag by itself. Once again, easy for you and I to recognize, maybe not necessarily your phone or computer or anything else. Uh, the number, is that okay? Um, it's gonna be one of those things that, uh, you know, if you actually are getting text messages from FedEx, that could be hard to determine because you're probably not receiving a ton of those. So, you know, might be hard to, uh, to read into that, but definitely something to look into. Is this an expected text if you didn't order anything? Not so much. So that should, that should definitely tip you off that this isn't a legitimate email. Now, a couple other things that are worth looking into. Number one, you know, have you ever received a text message regarding a package before? If you haven't, then I would be very, very skeptical of this. Um, you know, if you're not used to receiving texts about that. Um, also, you know, the domain name, the daerz.info, that is probably not a domain name that FedEx uses on a regular basis. Um, you know, they're going to use FedEx.com or something like that to help you track your package. Um, so, you know, any one of those things, uh, especially the ones in the red, should be a giant alarm in your head, um, you know, that this is not a legitimate email or excuse me, a text message. Now, here we have hovering, and we're going to talk about hovering a little bit here. Um, hovering is absolutely your friend. It's one of the best things that you can do. Now, why hover? If you look at the top example there, the treetopsecurity.com, you'll see the link there. And if we hover over it, which is just using your mouse to move over and, and uh, not click it, but actually just hover over it, you can see that the link itself is actually going to www.evil.com. So just because it says treetopsecurity.com does not necessarily mean that's where that link actually goes to. It can be a completely different website and oftentimes is. Now, we mentioned uh, dot, dot .fr on the previous page about for uh, France. Now, you can also have other ones for other countries. So dot .uk, um, obviously you can probably guess where that's from. .cn is China, .ru is Russia. If you see any one of these as the underlying link, um, that should be some giant red flags as well. Now, if you see anything that's numbers with dots in there, um, those are IP addresses, and most likely, you know, IT people, security people are probably used to seeing those. Um, that should never, ever, ever be in a standard email that you would see as a user. Also, you may say, well, what if I'm on my mobile, if I'm on my tablet? I don't have one of these mouse things that you're talking about. You can still do hovering, but it's actually a long press. And so what you do is you actually find the link, you hold down on it, um, and it eventually pops up a menu. And so on the right-hand side, you'll see that it has a mobile long press. And so that's the exact same link as above but it's just showing you, hey, this is where it goes, and it gives you a couple of context items that you can click on to uh, maybe look into it, open it, anything like that. Um, now, the caveat to that is that if you don't hold it down long enough, if you don't long press long enough, what have you done? You just click the link. So 
Um, you know, it's one of those things that if you're kind of uncertain, if you're already a little skeptical of the email or the link itself, then I would probably go over to another device or, you know, a computer or anything like that and definitely check it out from that angle instead rather than, uh, you know, trying to click it on your cell phone or your tablet. And really just any doubts, you know, make sure that you're not clicking it. A few other things, uh, shortened and obfuscated links. Um, obfuscated links, and I'm not going to say that too many times because I will inevitably screw it up. Um, but obfuscated links are uh, basically taking, you know, 300 characters or more and just really, really shorten it down. So in the example down below there, we have treetopsecurity.com slash cybersecurity dash awareness dash training dash feedback. And so we can actually condense that down to about 15 characters uh, just right above that, the HTTPS colon slash slash bit dot L-Y. Um, so you can see how helpful this would be in a lot of circumstances. Unfortunately, Criminals are starting to use this um, to, you know, to uh, basically getting abused by them to hide malicious websites. And the reason being is that you are going to do our little hover technique from the previous slide. You're going to hover over that and it's going to say, oh, this is Bitly. And you're going to say, oh, well, Bitly, I've used that before. And you're going to click on it. And unfortunately, Bitly is going to go to Bitly and then it's going to go to somewhere else. So what you can do with any sort of links is uh, copy paste them. You can go to, uh, I go to linkexpander.com. Happens to be a very, very popular one, but if you just type in link expander in Google or whatever your, your uh, uh, browser search is, um, you know, it'll bring you up to one that uh, does probably the exact same thing. But you just copy paste, you hit expand, and it shows you where it's actually going to. So really, really helpful. And here, as I mentioned, hovering is your friend. Um, if we're just going through those same systematic thought processes, you know, is the email address okay? In this particular case, not so much. Is the, is this an expected email? If I don't have an account with Amazon and I've never ordered anything from Amazon and all of a sudden I get an email from them, that's really weird about, you know, whether it's a, a misplaced package or a canceled order or something like that. Um, we will see a lot of sense of urgency, and that's something we haven't covered before, but you'll see attackers constantly use that sense of urgency saying, hey, you have 24 hours to do this, you have 48 hours to do this, and that's because they don't want you to think about it, they want you to rush through and just click on or do whatever it is. Now, if we're looking at this in a particular email, and you were to hover over that, you would see that the hover actually takes you to somewhere just completely off the wall. Um, definitely not Amazon.com. So, um, you know, attackers will use, you know, well-known brands, Amazon, Netflix, uh, things of that nature, because they know that most of us have those accounts. And so they're going to try and use those for a lot of the uh, mass emails. So just keep that in mind. All right. So a few more email attacks. Now, you may say, well, I thought you said we were going to talk about some other things. Yeah, where we talked about other things. The fact of the matter is that 92% of malware is still delivered via email, whether it's via links or other means. Here we're going to talk about some of those other means. So, First, um, email attachments. And so these are, um, you know, kind of use those same steps. Is this a recognized sender? If you, all of a sudden you just get an email out of the blue from someone and it has a uh, document attached or something, don't click on it. Don't assume that your antivirus or your firewall or whatever else is gonna protect you. Um, you know, are you expecting an attachment? So if this is somebody that you regularly converse with but they've never sent you a Word document before, that should really kind of tip you off. Right. And once again, that's something that you and I can recognize really easily. A computer, eh, not so much. Um, you know, and down below I have, uh, you know, the macros. If you use macros, you absolutely are familiar with macros. Um, but if you're not used to receiving macros and you see that screen in the lower right, um, you know, where it says enable this content, macros have been disabled. Um, you know, step one, don't do it. Step two, see step one. Um, that's being very, very serious. If you have never used macros, there is absolutely no reason why you would ever want to do that otherwise. A few other email scams. I realize I can say these are non-technical. 
Um, they're still email, yes, but they are very much non-technical. Uh, the spear phishing email where a CEO uh, or somebody that's posing as the CEO emails the CFO or someone else in the organization to try and get them to do something. Um, you know, we publish our organization charts on our website. Uh, we publish our board of directors and things like that. And really what it comes down to is we're making it really easy for the attacker. I mean, it's great to be able to show people that, you know, who's in those leadership positions, but at the same time, you're making that attacker's job a little bit easier. Um, if you are doing anything, you know, like uh, wire transfers and things of that nature, anything that's really substantial, um, you know, make a policy to where it just requires a follow-up phone call. Uh, that's really the easiest way to handle that. We just can't rely on email by itself. Um, what do attackers want out of these types of deals? Well, the prepaid cards, the wire transfers, like I talked about, um, you know, from owning uh, an MSP, an IT shop for uh, a long time, I can tell you uh, the number of people that got scammed by, you know, account and email credentials. And, and by that, I mean, an attacker sends them an email that says, hey, this is your IT department. Just letting you know that we're switching to a new email system. We're going to need your username and password. And people would send them just in droves. So, you know, just keep that in mind that, uh, you know, nobody should ever, ever, ever ask you for your password. Uh, once again, in both of these examples, we're seeing kind of that sense of urgency that we've talked about before. Obviously, it's in an email format this time. Um, but, uh, you know, just keep that in mind. A few other scammer favorites. Um, scammers absolutely love using uh, recent news events, uh, things that all of us are kind of concerned about, you know, whether it's health scares uh, like coronavirus, uh, protests, elections, uh, and they can also use local and regional news depending on if this is a targeted attack. So don't just assume, oh, well, they sent me something about my state or my province or whatever. Um, that's not you know, a spray and pray type uh, attack. Well, it actually uh, very well could be. Also, uh, seasonal holidays, attackers will absolutely use that to their advantage. Um, you know, a lot of times around the holidays, we're ordering additional things, we're getting deliveries. And so if they send something about an order getting canceled or delivery delayed or something like that, they want you to click on that. They, they know that uh, that's what we're doing. Also here in the U.S. around this time, um, you know, we're doing a lot with taxes. Um, so attackers will absolutely use taxes and say, sorry, the IRS wasn't able to issue your refund. Click here to find out why. Um, you know, and a lot of times that, that just works. So reach out and scam somebody. It's kind of a play off the uh, old uh, reach, and, reach out and touch somebody, right? And really what it comes down to is uh, social engineering. And it's you know, a lot of people just assume that because they see this number come through that that automatically means that's who it is. And really the uh, reality is, is that anybody, and I do mean anybody, can be shown how to make a spoofed number uh, from their cell phone in probably about 15 minutes. It's really that easy. So, you know, it really uh, kind of makes you think the next time you see a call coming from, say, the local hospital or the local energy company or anything like that. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind that attackers are absolutely using call spoofing. Um, you know, if somebody does call and uh, says, hey, this is the hospital, uh, you know, you were just in here in the last year, there's something messed up with the billing, can I get your social security number to verify who you are? Um, you know, the easiest way to get out of that is, I'm sorry, I'm really busy right now, I'm gonna have to call you back. And then what you do is go look up, uh, you know, in a phone book, if you have a phone book still, uh, go look in a phone book what that phone number that you should actually be calling is. Uh, look up on Google um, or, you know, whatever your search engine is. Look up a published phone number for that company. Call them back and, you know, see if they actually need something. Don't just assume based off that number by itself. Uh, some other phone scams, the one that I always like talking about, um, is the tech support scam, um, you know, and this once again is uh, from years of owning an IT shop. I can tell you we had about 10, 10 or so people uh, come in every single week that got scammed because Microsoft or Apple or Dell or insert big name company here called them and said, hey, looks like your computer's uh, uh, infected. We're going to help you out with this. 
just, you know, unfortunately, none of those big companies will ever contact you out of the blue. Uh, so just keep that in mind as we're going through that. So here is a, uh, uh, a phone call is actually for a neighbor of mine. Um, she still has the uh, wood grain uh, um, answering machine. And anyway, this is a message that was actually on her um, messaging machine. Now, if uh, you can't hear this for some reason or it doesn't come through, the white text up top is actually, uh, you know, a transcription of what's actually said. Message 1, Monday, 2, 19 p.m. Hi, this is Catherine from Microsoft. We have been trying to get in touch with you. However, we will be disconnecting your license within 48 hours, as your IP address has been compromised from several countries. So, we need to change your IP address and license key. So, please press 1 to get connected to Technic. All right, so obviously a very robotic voice, um, but you know, it's using a lot of the same things. It's using that sense of urgency. Um, would we ever, ever, ever expect a phone call from Microsoft in those regards? No. Um, like I said, she's a, a little bit on the uh, elderly side. Um, so, you know, she hears this and she thinks, okay, IP address, compromise. I've kind of heard about this hacking stuff on the news. You know, so she's putting a few things together and thinking, well, there, there's some legitimacy to this. Um, so I would argue this is actually purposely confusing. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, there's nothing that technical wise can actually solve this. Um, you know, there's nothing that's going to protect us against this. So just keep that in mind. But like I said, we used a lot of the same techniques that we had previously seen on other slides. All right. So last section here, talking about general tips and privacy. First and foremost, uh, USB drives, you know, anything like that, just never, ever, ever connect any unknown or unauthorized media or devices. Um, you know, and the reason being is that as soon as you plug that stuff in, it can actually start running things in the background without you touching a thing. Um, obviously, I already mentioned USB drives. You can also do SD cards, uh, micro SD cards, so the things that go in our phone or in uh, our cameras. Um, also, attackers have absolutely sent CDs and DVDs in the mail to people before uh, to try and compromise things. Um, external hard drives goes with that. And as I mentioned, I do a, a lot of uh, business security assessments. I always get a chuckle when I walk around and I see a lot of people with their phones plugged into their computers. And what are they doing? I mean, they're charging them. Uh, so it's not like they're doing anything malicious, but the fact of the matter is, is that their phone could absolutely be compromised or have a piece of malware or a virus or something like that on it. And by them plugging it in, it could actually infect their computers and potentially their entire organization. So just keep that in mind uh, that, you know, you don't want to do that. Go ahead and plug it into a wall instead. All right. So encryption, another one of those things that uh, a lot of people kind of... Uh, <laughs> their eyes glaze over when you start talking encryption. But the important thing is that, you know, encryption can be used to protect our data. It can also be used by attackers to protect them and what they're doing. So ransomware is a prime example of encryption gone wrong, really. Um, you know, when we're talking about protecting data, um, you know, HTTP versus HTTPS, that S means secure, it means it's encrypted. Uh, also, wireless, the reason why wireless is uh, widely accepted is because it does have encryption. Uh, WPA2 uh, AES is absolutely recommended there. And also, encryption can be used to protect our devices. So our mobile devices, if they're lost or stolen, so somebody can't get the information off of there. Um, also, you know, if you uh, boot up your device and ask for a PIN or a passcode, um, that's typically what it's doing is it's actually decrypting it. So now you're able to access that information and we can actually do this. Uh, you know, I just mentioned on uh, mobile devices, but you can absolutely do this on uh, laptops as well as desktop devices um, to protect them against theft as well. So on Microsoft Windows, we have BitLocker on Apple Mac OS. We also have File Vault. Um, you do have to have the pro version of Microsoft Windows, but it is absolutely fantastic, uh, and I would strongly uh, recommend it for all business. 
All right, so a few other internet safety quick tips. Um, first and foremost, you know, never install anything based on a pop-up. If you're going to a website and something pops up and tells you to call the number, just never, ever, ever do that. Um, trusted websites can and have hosted malware, uh, affectionately called malvertising. Um, you know, and, and, you know, local news uh, have often been subject to this, but, uh, you know, wherever it's at. But also, you know, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Yahoo, those are all places that have distributed malvertising as well in the past. So just keep that in mind. Uh, really kind of makes you think a little bit differently about, you know, the boss that says, oh, well, you're only supposed to use this for business related tasks. And uh, some, you know, some guy is uh, says, oh, well, I just want to check the score real quick on ESPN, uh, seeing that ESPN is one of the, the sites that has been compromised by this in the past and distributed malware. Um, also, a few other things to avoid, um, you know, public Wi-Fi, uh, especially if it's open Wi-Fi, uh, public computers like you would find at hotels, libraries, um, public charging stations have actually been in the news a few times. Um, not really too many cases that I know of, um, but it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Uh, one of the other things uh, to keep in mind, and for years and years and years, we kind of pounded into people's heads uh, for whatever reason that, uh, you know, if you see that padlock, that green padlock or gray padlock or whatever color the padlock is, if you see that padlock, that means that this site is 100% okay to visit and legitimate. And that's just not true. Um, what you're actually doing is that that means be, the data between you and that site is 100% encrypted, but it doesn't know if you've connected now to your bank or Bangladesh. So just because you see that padlock does not necessarily mean that that site is legitimate. So just keep that in mind. Internet privacy, internet uh, and data is the absolutely the new gold, um, no doubt about it. Um, you know, and the, I'm not going to go over everything on this slide, but uh, you know, the thing that I always talk about is oversharing and just people not really kind of thinking through that process. You know, if you're going on vacation, if you're checking into places, um, you know, your coffee shops and stores and everywhere else, I mean, what is that telling somebody else? That tells them that you're not at home. Um, so, you know, really, if you're, uh, you know, po posting your vacation photos and stuff like that while you're on vacation, uh, you know, it's just kind of crazy because, I mean, if you're not comfortable walking down the street and telling every single stranger that you meet or that you talk to, hey, I'm going on vacation. Hey, I'm going on vacation. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, then you just shouldn't post those vacation photos. Wait until you get back and then, heck, you can, re you know, kind of relive your vacation uh, the week following. So it's even better, right? <laughs> All right, so a few other uh, things. You know, number one, don't stop here. Uh, attackers change, attacks change. Make sure that you continue learning. Make sure that you continue helping to educate others. Um, you know, let them know about this, uh, the, this uh, presentation. When in doubt, ask questions, whether that's your IT department, your IT provider. Heck, if you want to ask Treetop, we're happy to, uh, to answer any and all questions for you as well. Uh, some additional resources. SANS does have an ouch newsletter. Um, I absolutely recommend this to everybody. Uh, it is a monthly newsletter. You will not receive spam as a result of it or anything else. Um, but what it is, is it's very much geared towards end users. So, you know, right around, uh, you know, the shopping season, um, they'll put in there, you know, some things on how to shop safely online. Uh, so there's a lot of great tips and tricks from SANS on a monthly basis, and I absolutely applaud them uh, for that particular newsletter. Also on our website, uh, as I mentioned, treetopsecurity.com slash cat, uh, you will find these slides. We also have uh, feedback for this presentation, so whether you loved it, hated it, uh, wish I would have explained something a little bit more, please let us know. Um, we also do have a quiz. Uh, so, you know, if you want to uh, go through this presentation and then test your knowledge and show it to your boss or, or anybody else, show them that, you know, you got a perfect score or something like that, uh, by all means, take that quiz. We also do have a certificate of completion uh, on the site that you can go in, uh, fill out and, uh, you know, print it off and, and uh, hang it on your wall or do whatever, uh, you know, share it with us on social media. We'd be happy to... Uh, to let others know that you're uh, you're uh, going through and uh, becoming more cybersecurity aware. 
And that's pretty much it. We appreciate your time and we look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks.